previously we discussed the binding change mechanism of ATP synthase and we said that the binding change mechanism is actually the mechanism by which the catalytic structure, the alpha 3 beta 3 hexamer of ATP synthase actually generates those ATP molecules, synthesizes those ATP molecules. Now in this lecture I'd like to focus on two important questions. Question number one, how does the movement of the protons across APT, uh, ATP synthase actually help us generate those ATP molecules? And question number two is, how many protons, how many hydrogen ions actually have to move through ATP synthase to actually generate a single ATP molecule? And to answer these two important questions, we actually have to describe the mechanism of the f naught region of ATP synthase. So remember, the ATP synthase consists of two different regions. One of the regions is known as the F1 region, and this is what we focused on in the previous lecture. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the f naught region. Now, remember that the f naught region actually consists of two types of polypeptide subunits. We have the C subunit and we have the A subunit. Now, we only have a single A subunit, but for the C subunits, we have anywhere from 10 to 14 C subunits that aggregate together to form something called the C ring. And it's the C ring, as we'll see in just a moment, that actually rotates within the ATP synthase and that allows that gamma epsilon stock to actually rotate and cause the binding change mechanism that we discussed in the previous lecture. So let's focus on the following diagram. So we have the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is the, uh, the matrix of the mitochondria and this is the intermembrane space. And this entire structure is the F0 region and the F0 region lies within the membrane of the mitochondria, within the inner membrane. Now, in this particular case, I've drawn 10 of these individual C subunits that form the C ring. And we have the A subunit that is found in close proximity to this C ring. Now, if we zoom in onto this A subunit, this is basically what we're going to see. Now, even though we don't exactly know what the structure of the A subunit actually looks like, this is what we believe the structure looks like. So, the structure of the A subunit seems to consist of two hydrophilic half channels that do not span the entire membrane of the A subunit. One of these half channels is open to the matrix side while the other one is open to the intermembrane side. So we have one of these half channels which only spans half the membrane that is open to the intermembrane side and the other a half channel is open to the matrix side and these two channels as we'll see in just a moment will actually play an important role in allowing the movement of the protons from the intermembrane space the high concentration to the matrix the low concentration now if we zoom in into the center of each one of these C subunits, shown in orange, we're basically going to find an aspartate 61 residue. And the special thing about the aspartate 61 residue is the side chain actually contains this negative charge. And the negative charge can actually grab a proton under acidic conditions. So the A subunit, this purple structure here, is positioned to interact with the C subunits. At the center of each one of these C subunits is an, asper uh, is an aspartate residue that can readily bind protons under acidic conditions. So now that we know what the structure of <coughs> Now what we know what the structure of the F1 region is, we can actually uh, deduce what the mechanism of proton movement looks like. So let's take a look at the following three steps and these are the diagrams that correspond to each one of these steps. So let's begin with diagram number one. So again, we have the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is the intramembrane space and this is the matrix of the mitochondria. 
Now, we know along the matrix, we have a low concentration of protons relative to the intermembrane space. Because remember, complexes one, three, and five, uh, one, three, and four of the electron transport chain basically use the movement of electrons to generate that proton electrochemical gradient. So we have a proton-rich environment in the intramembrane space, and we have a proton-poor environment in the matrix of the mitochondria. So in the first step, what happens is we have this hydrophilic half channel is open to the matrix of the mitochondria. And at the center of that half channel is this aspartate 61 residue that bears a negative charge. And so the proton will move from a high concentration through this half channel and it will bind onto that aspartate 61 residue found at the center of this C subunit that lies along this half channel. Now, once that movement actually takes place, once the movement takes place and the H plus binds onto this aspartate residue, we, we form aspartic acid. And aspartic acid is not as hydrophilic as aspartate. And so because aspartic acid is actually more hydrophobic, that aspartic acid that is formed when the H plus ion binds onto aspartate 61 will want to move into the hydrophobic region of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And so this subunit here, the C subunit, will tend to rotate. And let's say the rotation is in the, is in the clockwise direction. And as this C subunit rotates, it causes the entire C structure to actually rotate with it. And so what happens once this, uh, once this H plus ion moves into this section, it binds onto the aspartate residue forming the aspartic acid. Because aspartic acid is more hydrophobic, it wants to move into the core of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this rotates and that causes the entire C ring to actually rotate. And so what happens is, this negative charge of the aspartate 61 on this C subunit basically moves into this position shown here. And this aspartic acid, basically that is found within this C subunit, moves into this position. And now this H plus ion can move from this area to an area where we have a low proton concentration in the matrix of the mitochondria. And in this fashion, we see that the movement of these protons from the high, uh, from the high concentration to the low concentration basically powers the movement of this C ring. So once again, in diagram one, an H plus ion will enter the half channel of the A subunit facing the intermembrane space, and it will bind to that aspartate residue of the nearby C subunit. And once the binding takes place, it transforms aspartate 61 of that particular C subunit into aspartic acid. Because aspartic acid is more hydrophobic, it wants to move into the core of that inner membrane of the mitochondria and out of this uh, half channel. And so as that rotation takes place, it causes the entire C ring to actually rotate. So, the entire C ring then rotates until a C subunit with an aspartic acid enters the half channel that faces the proton poor environment of the matrix of the mitochondria. And once this is found in this position, the H plus ion can then move from the hydrophilic environment of this particular hemichannel and to the low, the poor, um, uh, the environment that contains a low concentration of those H plus ions. And so we conclude that the movement of the H plus ions through the half channels powers the rotation of that entire C ring. And remember from our previous discussion, the C ring is actually directly connected to that gamma epsilon stock that runs through that central cavity of that alpha three beta three hexamer. And so what happens is, since the C ring is directly connected to the gamma epsilon central stalk, it causes that central stalk to actually rotate. 
And when this central stalk actually rotates, it stimulates the binding change mechanism that takes place within the alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer that actually allows the synthesis and the release of those ATP molecules. And so ultimately, it's the movement of the protons across the hemichannels, uh, across the semichannels of the f naught region that allows the synthesis of these ATP molecules. Now, I have to mention the following important idea. So, the only thing that rotates in ATP synthase is the C-ring as well as the gamma epsilon structure. Everything else remains stationary. So that includes the A subunit. So the A subunit of the f naught region doesn't actually move. So this purple structure that contains the half channels actually remains stationary. It's the C-ring that actually rotates. And as that C-ring rotates, it causes this red section, the gamma structure, and the blue section, the epsilon structure, to actually rotate. And even though the gamma epsilon central stalk actually rotates through the central cavity of the, uh, of the alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer, because this A subunit does not rotate and the A subunit is connected to this delta structure through these 2B subunits, this entire alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer doesn't rotate as well. So this alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer structure remains stationary because it is connected via this structure to this stationary A subunit of the f naught region. So the movement of the protons through this ATP synthase rotates the C-ring and, and, and that in turn rotates the gamma epsilon stock, but everything else actually remains stationary. So, now we basically answered question one. So now we know how the movement of the protons across APT, uh, ATP synthase actually allows it to generate the ATP molecules. So once again, it's the movement of these hydrogen ions through the half channels of the f naught region that allows the rotation of the C-ring and that in turn rotates that gamma epsilon stock and that powers the synthesis of the ATP molecules within the stationary alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer structure. The final question is, how many protons actually have to move across the inner membrane of the mitochondria to synthesize a single ATP molecule. Well, as we saw in the previous lecture, a rotation of 360 degrees of the gamma epsilon structure actually produces a total of three ATP molecules. Why? Well, because in the alpha-3, beta-3 structure, we have a total of three beta structures, and each one of these beta structures actually synthesizes a single ATP molecule. And so when this gamma epsilon structure rotates uh, 360 degrees, it is able to generate the three ATP molecules. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, in this C-ring structure, we have anywhere from 10 to 14 C subunits. And that means anywhere from 10 to 14 of these H plus ions can actually move across the C-ring every time the C-ring rotates 360 degrees. So 360 degree rotation of the epsilon of the gamma epsilon stock produces three ATP molecules. We multiply that by the range of 10 to 14 H plus ions that move across the ATP synthase in a single 360 degree rotation. We see that 10 divided by 3 gives us about 3.33 and 14 divided by 3 gives us about 4.67. And so this is the range of protons that are needed to actually synthesize a single ATP molecule. And so we see that on average about four protons must move through the ATP synthase to actually generate a single ATP molecule. So again, this range actually describes the number of protons that have to move across the ATP synthase found on the inner membrane of the mitochondria to actually generate a single ATP molecule.